Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Hello, Church. My name is Eun Seo Kang. I'm one of the associate pastors here at Riceville United Methodist Church. It is my great joy to welcome you to our worship service at the Vine, an online campus of Riceville United Methodist Church. We are grateful to have this opportunity to worship together. No matter where you are joining us from, we cherish your presence with us today. So it is our prayer that through today's worship service, you will encounter God in a meaningful way and receive a blessing that touches your heart and life. Today is Christ the King Sunday, which is the final Sunday of Christian year. So today we remember that the crucified God who reconciles the world to himself is the same God who will come to us as a humble baby in a manger on Christmas. This amazing truth about God being with us in both great and humble times guides our worship today. So let us open our hearts and mind to experience God's love and grace. As we reflect on this mystery, our connection to the divine deepens on our faith journey. Now, let us take a deep breath and feel closer to our Lord. Let us go before God in opening prayer. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, we come before you to praise and affirm that you are indeed our Lord. You are the Lord of Lords. You are the King of glory and King of kings. Lord, we pray for your kingdom to come here now and reign forever in our hearts and in this world. Thank you for your goodness and kindness. Thank you for your generosity and compassion. Thank you for loving us. And thank you for your kingdom that is unlike any kingdom in this world. In your glory and grace we pray. Amen. in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm Pastor Julia Hayes. I'm one of the associate pastors here, and it is my joy to get to lead us in prayer today, even as I am leading us all in prayer all the way from Columbus, Ohio. Will you join me now as we pray? Holy and loving God, we give you great thanks today for gathering us together in worship. God, we thank you that your power is such that you can bring us together across time and space to worship you, even when we aren't physically together. 
God, on this Christ the King Sunday, we thank you that you are Lord of Lords and King of Kings. God, we thank you that you hold all of the world and the universe within your hand. God, we also confess that so often instead of trusting you as our king, we have instead looked to earthly sources of power. We've placed political persuasion over your kingdom coming on earth. Lord, forgive us when out of our own pride, we have sought our own will above yours. Lord, we ask that your kingdom would come on earth, your kingdom of justice and mercy and peace. Lord, we ask that you would make us true citizens of your kingdom who live in the ways that you have called us to live. God, even as we pray this, we pray also for those who we know of and whose names we don't know throughout our world who are suffering. We pray for those who are sick or perhaps near death. We pray for those who are suffering war and violence. We pray for those who are suffering in mind, body, or spirit. Lord, we ask that you would draw near to all those who are suffering and remind them of the power granted to us through your resurrection. And God, we pray especially for all those who we name before you now, either out loud or in our hearts. God, we thank you that you not only hear our prayers, but you listen to them. We ask God that now you would help us to mean what we say as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us, not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we transition now into a time of reflection and generosity, I'd like to remind you that you can always support the ministries of Wrightsville United Methodist Church through the post, through our website, rightsvilleumc.org, and through our smartphone app. Let us now continue to worship the Lord our God. kids it's pastor Julia here you might not recognize where I am and that's because I'm actually at home with my parents and my grandma and my sister in Columbus Ohio which is where I'm from did you spend time with your extended family for Thanksgiving this week Thanksgiving is a time when we usually get together with our families and maybe you saw people from your family that you don't get to see every day like uh, grandma or grandpa or maybe cousins or um, all sorts of different people who are in our families. Well, I really love spending time with my family and this year it got me thinking about a really cool promise that's in the Bible. In the letter to the Ephesians, Paul says that all of us, all of us Christians have been adopted into God's family. So not only do we have our families here on earth, like your mom or your dad or your siblings, but we're also part of a huge family, which is God's family. So I hope that in this holiday time, as you're spending time with your family here on earth, you also remember that you have been chosen by God to be a part of God's special family. And that is good news. Let's say a prayer now together. Dear God, thank you for making me. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for adopting me into your family. I love you too. In Jesus' name, amen.
Our scripture lesson for today comes from the Gospel according to John. We're in chapter 18, beginning in verse 33. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I'm not a Jew. Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king, for this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, What is truth? This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Holy God, help us to understand the truth. Help us to know who Jesus is. And most importantly, where he is in our lives. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Well, church junkies know that this is the last Sunday of the church year. The church year, of course, runs differently from the calendar year. The church year begins next week with Advent, that time that we set aside to prepare for the coming of Christ. Advent is followed by Christmas, which naturally celebrates the birth of Jesus. Then Epiphany, when Jesus is revealed to the world. Followed by Lent, when Jesus begins to look toward his ultimate sacrifice. And then Easter, when we celebrate Jesus being raised from the dead. And then the last season of the church year is Pentecost, which recognizes the power of the Holy Spirit and the growth of the church across the globe and through the ages. Which brings us to the very last Sunday of the church or Christian year, Christ the King Sunday. This Sunday culminates our journey throughout the year, from Jesus' birth, life, death, resurrection, and beyond, to the most basic affirmation of faith that there is, that Jesus Christ is Lord. For the last 100 years, American Christians have emphasized the notion of taking Jesus as their Savior. That means that a person recognizes that Jesus died for them and saved them from their sins so that they might have eternal life. That is a vitally important recognition to make. But I believe it's only half of the Christian formula. The other half is accepting Jesus as our Lord. And that's what I want to talk about today on Christ the King Sunday. We're saying something very powerful when we celebrate Christ the King Sunday. When we call Christ the King and talk about his kingdom, we're saying something about power. Specifically, who has it? And conversely, who doesn't? Pontius Pilate understood that. He asked Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? This is not a casual question, although Pilate seems to be taunting Jesus when he asks him. But this word king, it ends up being repeated nine more times during this encounter between Pilate, Jesus, and the Jewish leaders. Jesus' response is interesting. Instead of a direct answer, he comes back with another question. Is that your own idea, or did others talk to you about me? Sounds a little bit smart aleckly, or at least pretty bold considering his perilous situation. The Jewish leaders had brought Jew Jesus to Pilate after an illegal midnight trial. They made it perfectly clear that the expectation was that Pilate would condemn Jesus to death. So one would think that flippant answers might not be the best idea. Pilate, of course, is equally flippant in his response. Am I a Jew? The implication being that even an idiot wouldn't make that mistake. In fact, that attitude was characteristic of Pilate's entire administration in Judea. In his arrogance, he never even pretended to identify with the people in his charge, and the result was an ill-tempered, mean-spirited regime that would have long ago been relegated to the dustbin of history if he had lived at another time. His name would have quickly been forgotten, except for one memorable, dare I say, earth-shaking incident that we have recorded in the Gospels. It was your people and your chief priests who handed you over to me, 
What is it that you've done? Jesus responds, but not with anything that would actually answer Pilate's question. He says, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest from the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate's still confused. So you are a king then. You're right in saying that I'm a king, says Jesus, but we might add, like no other king we've ever seen before, or after for that matter. There was a preacher back in 19th century Scandinavia who was in the vestry one Sunday morning when he heard that the king would be present at worship. Understandably rattled, he ditched his well-prepared sermon and spoke on and on about the Christian virtues of his king. Even though the king said nothing after the service, the preacher could not help but wonder if he would receive some reward for his loyal support. Sure enough, some time later, a very large crate was delivered to the church. Immediately, the priest concluded that his reward had finally arrived. He pried open the crate to find inside a giant life-sized crucifix. He could hardly contain his disappointment. We've got lots of crucifixes already, he thought. As he looked inside the crate, he saw a letter under the royal seal. Excitedly, he opened it. The letter contained the king's instructions as to the placement of the crucifix in the church. It was to go on the wall of the church behind where the people sat, so that when the preacher was preaching, he would always be reminded of which king he should be speaking about. Now let's return to today's celebration of Christ the King. I'm sure you know that Christ is not Jesus' last name. It's his title. It comes from the Greek word Christos, which means the anointed one, or the Messiah in Hebrew. In Old Testament times, the title of anointed one was regularly applied to kings. But by the time of Jesus, the Jewish people were no longer looking for a Messiah, but rather for the Messiah who would come at last and lead them in victory against their oppressors. They wanted a conquering hero who would overthrow the hated Romans. It soon became evident that this was not God's intention with Jesus. For those who had their hopes pinned on a military messiah, this was a devastating blow. Indeed, some have speculated that this was Judas's problem, that once he found out that his dream of conquest was over, he was done with Jesus. And the rest of the story we know all too well. But we know the story doesn't end sadly. That's why we culminate the Christian year with Christ the King Sunday. This is the day that we can rock the rafters of the universe with our declaration that Jesus Christ is Lord. Lord. To the ancients it meant master or owner. It was always a title of consummate respect. In the modern world, to call Jesus Lord is to say he is the chief, the boss, the main man, the head honcho, the CEO. The buck stops with him. His decisions are final. Jesus Christ is Lord. These four words were the first creed that the Christian church ever had. To be a Christian then and to be a Christian now is to make that same affirmation. If someone can say, Jesus Christ is Lord, then they are a Christian. If we say that Jesus Christ is Lord, it means that for us, Jesus Christ is uniquely in charge. That we are prepared to obediently follow in whatever direction the Lord chooses to lead us. Even if he goes where we would prefer he might not. If we say Jesus Christ is Lord, that means his priorities will become our priorities. We will be drawn to those on the margins, the outcasts, and even those that society, and dare I say sometimes even the church, suggest that we ought to stay away from. If we say Jesus Christ is Lord, then we will take religion seriously. We will worship, we will study, we will pray, and we will give sacrificially, just as Jesus did. If we say Jesus Christ is Lord, it means we are saying that other people or other things are not Lord of our lives. That money is not our Lord. That politics is not our Lord. That technology is not our Lord. These are all useful to us, but Jesus still comes first. 
If we say Jesus Christ is Lord, it means we're prepared to give to Jesus a love and a loyalty that will be given to no other person in the entire universe. What does Jesus Christ as Lord mean to you? You know, Jesus, he painted no pictures that we know of. Yet some of the finest paintings of Raphael, Michelangelo, and Leonardo da Vinci received their inspiration from him. We don't know that Jesus wrote any poetry, but Dante, Milton, and scores of the world's greatest poets were inspired by him. Jesus composed no music. Still Haydn, Handel, Beethoven, Bach, Brahms, and Mendelssohn reached their highest perfection in the hymns, symphonies, and oratorios that they composed in his praise. As Emerson once noted, the name of Jesus is not so much written as it is plowed into the history of the world. But none of that history has ever been able to tell the whole story. Here's just a sampling of what some of the greatest minds in history have to say about Jesus. One says, I know men, and I tell you that Jesus Christ is no mere man. Between him and every other person in the world, there is no possible term of comparison. Alexander, Caesar, Charlemagne, and myself founded empires. But what foundation did we rest the creation of our genius? Upon force. Jesus Christ founded an empire upon love. And at this hour, millions of men would die for him said Napoleon Bonaparte. Next, the great military leaders of the past have gone. Their empires have crumbled and burned to ashes. But the empire of Jesus, built solidly and majestically on the foundation of love, is still growing, said Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Next, a man who was completely innocent offered himself as a sacrifice for the good of others, including his enemies, became the ransom of the world, it was a perfect act, said Mahatma Gandhi. Albert Einstein said, I am a Jew, but I am enthralled by the luminous figure of the Nazarene. Jesus is too colossal for the pen of phrase mongers, however artful. He further added, no man can read the Gospels without feeling the actual presence of Jesus. His personality pulsates in every word. No myth is filled with such life. Theseus and other heroes of his type lack the authentic vitality of Jesus. And Dickens wrote, I commit my soul to the mercy of God through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I now most solemnly impress upon you the truth and beauty of the Christian religion as it came from Christ himself and the impossibility of going far wrong if you humbly but heartily respect it. And last... It's a very good thing that you read the Bible. The Bible is Christ. For the Old Testament leads up to this culminating point that Christ alone has affirmed as a principal certainty eternal life, the infinity of time, the nothingness of death, the necessity and the raison d'etre of serenity and devotion. He lives serenely as a greater artist than all other artists, despising marble and clay as well as color working in living flesh. That is to say, this matchless artist made neither statues nor pictures nor books. He loudly proclaimed that he made living people immortal, said Vincent Van Gogh. I could go on and on because millions upon millions of words have been written and spoken about Jesus. But today, I really just want to leave you with four. Jesus Christ is Lord. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Holy and loving God, you are the author and perfecter of the universe. And you have sent Jesus into this world, Lord, to be Lord over all over all creation, and over our lives. Lord, we look forward to the day when every knee shall bow and every tongue confess those four simple words, that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen.
there are so many things in this world that are competing for our loyalty and allegiance. I hope that you can say along with me those four simple words that make all the difference. That Jesus Christ is Lord. That he's Lord of all creation and Lord of your life. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.